Good morning to you. Happy Columbus Day weekend. You're like, the people are really happy you're on vacation right now. I'm here. No, we're glad that you're here being a part of this long weekend. You can grab a seat. I want to tell you about something that happened about six years ago. In 2013, a guy named Mike Drish, he got up one morning having a pretty normal day. And much like many of us have done from time to time, in that day he had this plan that he was going to go to a game. He had bought tickets to go see a basketball game. So he got up that morning and went about his day and eventually he made his way to a Miami Heat basketball game. But instead of remaining in the stands, he was invited down to the floor. And the rest, well, we'll just watch the rest. Here's what happened. Right, check it out. Tonight, on this very night, on this very court, you will have a chance to win, silence please, $75,000. Mike D, the only thing standing between you and $75,000 is one, one half court shot. He fans, can he do it? Make some noise right now. Look at all these people rooting for you, Mike. You've got one half court shot. $75,000. Are you ready? Yes. Give him the basketball, please. By the way, Mike D, $75,000. All right, Mike, here we go. Oh man, there's so much I love about that moment. The first is this, as a communicator, did you notice the guy kept calling him Mike D? It's because he had no idea how to pronounce his last name. I just made it up, folks. People look at me sometimes and they ask me about, how do I pronounce his name in the Bible? I say, I'm not really sure, but I say it with confidence so you think I'm right. That's what this guy's doing. That guy in no way, shape, or form, can we say, did he look like a basketball player? Right? He had his hoodie on. He wasn't necessarily as tall or maybe built like a regular basketball. I'm really loving his high white socks, right? Uh, but in that one moment in his life, he came out of the stands and became more than a fan. And he hit, frankly, a very ugly shot. Can we all agree? And the place went great. I mean, so much, he won $75,000. And I don't know if you know who that was who tackled him. That was LeBron James. He, I mean, he was ecstatic about that. And it couldn't have been because of the money because LeBron James made $75,000 in the time it took me to show you that clip, right? I mean, it wasn't about the money. It was about something great. And this is my opinion, my opinion only. In all of human history, there may be no uglier shot than that. <laughs> Yet he took his shot, it went in, and people celebrated. He had his moment. We've been in this series... Over the last six weeks, encouraging us as people to not to just be sitting in the stand, so to speak, but to be more than a fan and take the shots that Jesus wants us to take so we can be the type of people that he wants us to be for the types of things he wants to happen in our world. We've talked about this truth, this challenge, sad sometimes, but, but true, that we in our spiritual lives often become a lot like fans in the professional world. Have you met those people that know all the stats? They have 16 different fantasy teams. They can tell you from their couch on Sunday what the team should have done, but they can't do it themselves. You know what I'm talking about? They know all kinds of things about it, but they don't actually engage. And, and unfortunately, if we're not careful, it can happen in our lives as Christians where we can become people that become completely and utterly satisfied with knowing a lot of Jesus' stats. We can quote you the scriptures. We might know a lot of Jesus' stories. We're, we're not ashamed that we're part of a church. We you know, may even have a logo on the back of our car. Please, if you're cutting someone off in traffic, please put a different logo on the back of your car. Right? We, we know all of these things, but when it actually comes to the moment, we're taking the truths that we know about, the stats and all of that, and putting them into play in our, in our lives, sometimes we fall short and, and we don't really look like players. We look a whole lot more like people who just sit in the stands. And so as we've engaged this series, what we've said is that we want to be people who aren't just satisfied with being a couch potato. 
when it comes to our spiritual life or being satisfied with sitting in the stands. But we wanna be people who are actually living out the purpose that God has for us. And so what we've done is we've introduced each and every one of us who've been a part of this series, whether it's been online or right here in this room, to seven rhythms, seven rhythms that the early church practiced, some of the, the greatest players in all scripture that helped them move from just being fans to being players. And so each week we've talked about certain things. We've talked about this idea of daily devotion. We've talked about the concept of prayer. Several weeks ago, I talked about this reality that many of us have strongholds in our life that keep us from walking in the way that God wants us to walk, and we need freedom from that. Both Pastor Will and Pastor Chris, they spend some time talking about the importance of service and then sharing your story and how sacrificial generosity matters. And this week, we're going to come to this rhythm <clears throat> that's basically called celebration. Some of you are like, finally, a rhythm I know how to do, right? Some of you extroverts here, you're like, woohoo! I get a chance to party because how, how many, let's just take a, a survey of the room. How many here, when someone says party, you say where? Let me see, right? Look at these people. These are the people that make you uncomfortable in public for those of you who are introverts, right? I am married to a woman that not only when does someone say party, she says where, she says not only where, but what do I wear, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many times we've invited to parties where we're supposed to dress up. And my wife will get so excited. She'll come to me and she goes, Brian, I have this great costume idea for you. And I'm like, does it involve jeans and an untucked long shirt? Because this is my costume. I wear it all the time. It's called the Brian. That's all I want. <laughs> right? She's like, no. And then she tells me all of this. And I'm like, ah. She loves it. By the way, I know a lot of you do. And we do like to party and we do like to celebrate. In fact, on the 27th of October, as a way again to interject ourselves into the new community that we're gonna be at, over in Ashbrook near One Loudon, we're gonna have this thing called Trunk or Treat. Some of you may have heard of that or know that. You get to dress up, you get to bring people in the neighborhood uh, and be a part. It goes from 4 to 5.30. It's gonna be at our new property at 44505 Atwater. You get a chance to kind of walk around the parking lot a little bit, look at it, but it'd be a great time. Bring your neighbors, bring your friends. If you wanna know more information, just check it out online. But when we're talking about celebration this morning, this is not an introvert, extrovert thing. This isn't a party thing, even though celebration often has a party. But when we think about this idea of what's important in our life in order to move us from the stands into the actual arena of playing it out, this is how I want us to think about celebration. Celebration as a rhythm in our life of something that we do is a continual joyous practice of praising God's work in our lives and in the lives of others for this purpose, for worship and for encouragement. And we've said as we've delved into this that the early church, some of the greatest people who've moved out of the stands and began to play for what Jesus wanted to do, they practiced these rhythms over and over again. And so we're gonna go back to a section of scripture this morning that I've talked about in a small way twice already and it's the book of Acts chapter two. And if you have a copy of scriptures, turn right there to Acts chapter two. If you don't have a physical copy, like a physical copy, raise your hand, someone will pass you a copy who's walking around. If you're watching online, just dial in on the digital device, you're already there. It'll be pinned there. If you're in the room and you're like, I, I, I just wanna do it on my handheld, that's fine. However you do it, it's important to go there because as we're going to go to Acts chapter two again, we're gonna see that this rhythm of celebration was something that not only did they do every once in a while, but they continually did. So in Acts chapter two, we've already looked at verse 42 several times throughout this series. We're gonna go forward a few verses and we're gonna look at verse 46 and verse 47. And we're gonna see these people in the early church, how they lived when it came to this. This is what it says in verse 46. Every day they, the they being the early believers, the people of the early church, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God, catch that verse 47, and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God, uh, as we delve into this last rhythm that you have shown us through your people in scripture, may you show us in our lives the so many places that we have reasons to be joyfully celebratory, joyfully celebratory about who you are and what you've done. And may we respond in a way 
that both gives you worship and encourages others. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, we've been saying many times that what we're asking ourselves to do in these rhythm is something that's continually, we said it this way, daily devotion, when we looked at verse 42, daily prayer. And here again, this idea of celebratory things, of celebration and praising, it's a daily thing. Because when you look at verse 47, it says, praising God. Now, this is the third time I've said this, but it's important. In the original language, when that's written, that's written in what's known as the Greek present tense. In our present tense in English, it's more like something that happened once in the past, like a photograph. In the Greek present tense, it's more like a movie, something that happens, and those photographs continue to play out. So when it says that they were praising God, it doesn't mean it's just one moment, but it means that they had this continually action of celebrating God and what he's doing in their life and what he was doing in others. And when we look at them, I think the, the question that we be needing to draw from is, is what did they have to celebrate? Because when we look at the early church, we understand they were under persecution. When we look at the early church, we understand that the Roman people wanted them to be dead. When we look at the early church, we see people from the Jewish background who converted to Christianity, who no longer had homes or families. It would seem like they had every reason to be upset and angry, yet they are celebrating and in fact, they had reasons to celebrate, I believe, more than just making a $75,000 hook shot, even though I'm sure that would come in handy. And so I want us to think this morning about some reasons that we have in our life to celebrate who God is and what he's done. Because when we look at the early church, they did. And, and here's, here's one. There's many we can talk about, but here's one. This is what it says later on in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17... The Apostle Paul now is, is talking about something that they already knew. And says this, he, God himself, gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. They had many reasons to celebrate, but the very first is that they had life and they had breath. They were physically alive. I know for some of us you're like, well, that seems like kind of a low bar, right? You ever thought about that? Like giving praise for a living kind of seems a low bar. I want to tell, us, tell you that I believe because we live in the year 2019 in the United States of America, we have come to take for granted amazingly the health that we have. The average age lifespan of someone in the United States is about 79 years old. Some of you are like, man, I'm getting closer. I'm already past my expiration date. You know, uh, that's not, you know, it's not like exactly, but around 79 in early Roman society, around AD 34, AD 35, when this was, you know that the, the conservative estimate, if you were actually able to, to go past the unbelievably bad infant mortality rate and make it into this world, the conservative estimate was that it was 40 years you could live. Some places go and talk about that the average lifespan of someone around that time was about 25 and we don't know for sure, but we know this, how they lived and the very fact that they were living and breathing at whatever state there was, they had reason in that moment to celebrate that because they understood that God was the one that gave them any life and breath that they had. They had reason to celebrate because they had physical life. They also had reasons, by the way, to celebrate because they had life and breath, not just physically, but spiritually in this thing called salvation. 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2, the apostle Peter, who shows up a lot in the book of Acts that we've been focusing on, he's writing to a group of people a lot like them right around the same time. And he reminds them of this fact that he says, you're a chosen race, you're a chosen people, you're a royal priesthood. You are now people who belong to God. You're people of his own possession so that you may proclaim the excellencies, that you may praise the greatness that you may celebrate who God is because he has called you out of darkness into light. Now, if you're a part of a church and you've been a part for a church for a while, there's probably some things that when you hear this, you just you basically grasp. But say maybe this is one of the first times you're just you know, checking us out online or you're in here and you're, you're still thinking through the reality of of what it means to have a faith. This is what scripture tells us about our situation pre-Jesus, that we as people were kind of stumbling around in the dark. 
And that without the light that Jesus provides in our life, the relationship that makes it possible through his death, burial, and resurrection, that if we believe on, we will be people who stumble around in life. And when life ends, we will remain in darkness, completely separated from God and eternity in a place that is known in Scripture, known as hell. But they now understood that because what Jesus had done, they no longer had to stumble around in darkness. They actually had light. They could have been people that even with the greatest, and I want you to think about the most rich, the most successful the most person who would be most likely to succeed in the Roman society, they still, if they were on average, had about 40 years. That's not a lot. Now that they know, they just understand that they don't have to be separated from God, that this life was not all there is, they now had a place for hope, no matter where they fell on that idea, most likely to succeed or not. For a friend of mine that, that's reminded me this over and over again, and it goes something like this, using a little bit of a version change, but at best... This life is a really great train station. Think about that. You ever been to Union Station? Have you been to Union Station? I dropped my, my wife and my daughter off there about 4.30 in the morning just recently. They're celebrating, turning 13, and so they're going somewhere together. But part of the celebration, man, I had to get myself up out of bed and get them to the train station early. Union Station's a beautiful place. You pull, it, It's gorgeous. But do you know what Union Station is not? It's not where I want to live. I can spend some time there. They got restaurants. I can, but it isn't my final landing place. It completely and utterly exists for a moment knowing that it is transitionary. Now listen, there's nothing wrong with a great train place. Enjoy it while you're there. Right? But it's also important to know that this life is more than just Union Station. There's more to it. And no longer now do they have to live like people that the sum total of their life and their whole experience would be based upon this small amount of years they would have. But rather they were people now who belonged to God. They were his possession. And their current position with him was guaranteed. And not only was their current position guaranteed, but that one day when this life came to an end, they would be in a relationship with him as well. If we didn't say anything else this morning, the people of the early church had two unbelievable reasons to constantly celebrate God, to live in the rhythm of celebration. And that is this. Number one, that they were breathing. And number two, that God had then made it a part of his mission to draw them into a relationship with him and they had him as their father. Listen, that would be enough. It would be enough. Yet beyond that, what we see is this, is that not only did they have life here and then also spiritual life with the Heavenly Father, that, that Heavenly Father promised to help them. It was another reason to celebrate. Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, as he's preaching, and we talk about this lots of times. Pastor Chris mentioned it last week, Acts chapter 7, I mean rather Matthew chapter 7. In verse 7, this is what he says. He's, Jesus tells his followers, ask and it'll be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be open to you. I want you to take this in contrast to the reality of how the average person understood a false god. All the false gods were there to be appeased. They weren't there to help you. You were there to help them. But the true and living God, the one who created this whole world, the one who, because of who he is and what he's done, we can have eternal and physical life. He actually wants to Help us. He wants to be involved. That should be a reason, and that's a reason that they had to celebrate. And as this occurred, as they had life and breath physically, they had life and breath spiritually, and they had the help from God, one of the great ways that they received that help from God was that the fourth thing they had to celebrate was that God had now planted them in a new community. I mentioned this earlier, but I'm not sure that we quite grasp the impact on someone who came to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior in that early days. If they were a Roman citizen, and that is what they chose to do, they had signed themselves up many times for persecution and difficulty, certainly to be excommunicated. If they had, from a Jewish background, and they had believed not that Jesus was Messiah, and now they believe that Jesus was Messiah, 
what that did was, is for many of them, they were completely ostracized. They were kicked out of their homes. That means that they were no longer acceptable in the family business. They were no longer acceptable in the family home. They no longer had the inheritance that came with being in the family line. They were completely and utterly on their own. Yet, what happened is amazing because when people originally became followers of Jesus, they were excommunicated from their current community. Yet, in this new thing, this thing called church, this, this hodgepodge of people from different backgrounds, socioeconomic status and racial differences, they found a place of belonging, a place, by the way, that wasn't based upon the color of the skin, the encoding of their DNA, or the size of their wallet, or the political regime they happened to support. Their new community was based upon the grace of Jesus that made all of them as different as they might be, connected in a whole new and powerful way. And so if we begin to ask this question in our own minds, did, did they have reason to celebrate? Well, the answer is, yes, they did. And so do we, by the way. I'm not sure we as a people are that good at celebrating. I mean, we're good at celebrating. I mean, like, if the Redskins happen to win today, we will celebrate that, right? Some of you watched the Nationals yesterday, right? Right? Up to nothing. We celebrate that. So I'm not saying that we're not good at celebrating some things. I'm just saying that if we're just gonna be honest, we often, many times, aren't so great at celebrating the most important thing. I don't say that as guilt. I don't say that to shame any of us. But when we understand who Jesus is and what he's done, we understand who God is and what he's done, that really outweighs the Redskins winning another game, even though if that happens, that will be what's called a miracle, right? <laughs> Some of you are like, you're making fun of the Redskins. No, I'm a Browns fan. I make fun of no one. I, I hurt with them, Okay. When we as a people who have a relationship with God do not create intentional, joyous moments of celebration about what God has done in our lives and others, what will happen is this, is that we will begin a habit of easily forgetting what God has done, and then we'll begin to live in a way where we take those things that he's done for us for granted, and as a result... We will easily be overcome by the things in this world. We'll find ourselves up on the bleachers just being fans, not out there on the court taking shots that we can take. And here's the interesting thing. The more that we act like fans, the more that we live like fans, when we don't practice the rhythm of celebration, the more opportunities we miss that God is providing to celebrate more. The guy didn't have to go down to the floor and take the shot. I mean, I want you to know this. If that guy hooked a shot like that, he kind of knew already he probably wasn't that good at basketball. Don't you think? He could have said to himself, well, this is gonna be recorded and some pastor is gonna play this on a video in the future and I don't wanna be publicly shamed so I'm not gonna go down there. Yet, because he was willing to do what he did and relegate himself off the stands into the court and take the shot, he had an experience. How easily it is for us to be people who can become sideline dwellers, who can become bench warmers or cheap seat people. And when that happens over and over again, we're gonna miss something. And listen, Jesus and the things that he's done is worth celebrating. There's this time, I think, in life where, if you notice, we stop celebrating birthdays, and then later on in life, we pick them up again. You know what I'm saying? I like, remember, like, when, when someone turned one, it was like, yay, five, yay, 10, yay, 13, or if it's an Ashburn, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, whatever it might be, <laughs> right? But I don't know where it is. <clears throat> Maybe it's somewhere around 30, 35, or 40. We stop making a big deal about it, because you're like, oh, I'm getting old, Right? Now, somewhere along the way then, we pick back up again because we're like, man, I made it past my expiration date. I should celebrate. You know what I'm saying? What happens in those moments between when we stop and when we start up again? Do we have any less reason to celebrate? No. But I want to say we can spend a whole lot of time in that in-between time taking for granted lots of stuff. When we do that with what God has been done in our life, the result is, is, is challenging. It's, we become fans and 
we do have reasons to celebrate. And might I suggest we have at least four. They're gonna sound really familiar. Here's the first, that we have life and breath. You are here this morning, watching online. That's, that's a reason to celebrate. It doesn't mean you're feeling really good. Can I make a confession? I'm gonna anyway, so it doesn't matter if you say no. My back hurts like crazy right now. I'm trying to work through my third kidney stone. I'm working completely off adrenaline. I don't say that for sympathy. I don't at all. But you know what God has taught me now in my third bout with kidney stones is to be grateful for every day I don't have them. And in some ways, even today, uh, I'm pretty uncomfortable. It wasn't as bad as my second bout with kidney stones. The, the one that Ernie, we were talking about that made me say, Jesus, I wanna come home. That bout, right? <laughs> that bout, this is nothing like it. So I've discovered that no matter what, every day, if I have life and breath given me by God, there, there's a reason to celebrate. But I don't only just have life and breath right now and whatever time I have on this earth to celebrate, I also have life and breath, spiritual salvation. For God, it says in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, he didn't destine me to the wrath that I deserved, but instead he destined me to obtain salvation through Jesus Christ. Verse 11 says this, because of that reality, therefore, Encourage one another and build one another up just as you are doing. Look, yes, at best, this life is a train station. And some of you said, my train station of life looks nothing like Union Station. It's been horrible. It's been nasty. It's been awful. Yet, there's still reason to celebrate God because this life isn't all that there might be if we have a relationship with God. If we have a relationship with God, we know that this life is more than that. We have this and what is to come with him. So there's reason to celebrate. And by the way, that would be enough just like them that we have life and breath and that it's physical and we have life and breath and it's spiritual and salvation. But we also, we as a people have help from God. If you've been around me at all in these last several years, there's a good chance I've quoted what's come to be one of my favorite verses about how God is willing <clears throat> to be involved in our life and help us. It's from Hebrews chapter four, verse 16. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of God, the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find his grace to help us in time of need. You say, <clears throat> why would I need this? Why would you need this? Because I need help. How about you? And it's not just necessarily I need help physically. And, and certainly there are times I need help physically. But I found myself recently in a place where I, I discovered I, I needed some significant emotional help from God. I was in a phase where I was struggling uh, with the D word that pastors aren't allowed to say. Dallas. No, depression. Hmm. I was. Now, I want to take a moment before I talk about this to talk, take just a side note, I can, right? The type of depression I'm talking about in just a moment is that overwhelming feeling that happens from time to time that all of us go through. But there are also other types. And I think some of you in this room know exactly what I'm talking about and you feel uncomfortable in a church talking about your depression because churches have a really bad reputation of doing this. That if we talk about having cancer, unless you get cancer because you've been smoking like a chimney your whole life, we all recognize that cancer is due to the fall and wasn't designed. It's a health issue. But when we talk about depression, more often than not in a church, we assume that you have sinned, not that you live in a sinful world. That's not the truth. There are many of us who know what it's like to go through this chemical issue, being off in balance and that sort of thing because we live in a fallen sinful world, right? And for some reason, maybe you've prayed, prayed, and prayed, and God hasn't healed it that way yet. God still loves you and cares for you. That's not, at this time, what I was struggling with. It was just this moment of being down and over and, and feeling like, God, I, you know, truthfully, I'm just struggling, God. Because I wasn't seeing and still had difficulty seeing some things 
that I felt like I wanted God to accomplish through this place called Christian Fellowship Church. How many of you ever been in a place at your, your work or your home or whatever and, and, you, and you feel like you are doing blank, blank, and blank and you expect when you do these blank things, certain things should happen on the other end. Pastor Fred, you know what that's like, right? But then it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen the way you think it should or the way you feel it should and, then, and you have these moments and, and I was having some pretty significant moments and so I went to God and I, I said this first. I said, God, you need to help me because I'm struggling. And, and as much as I'm standing here, I felt as God said, well, Brian, why don't you practice what you preach and celebrate what I've already done? I hate it when God does that. You ever had that? You ever, you ever seen God do that? Like, oh, you're, you're studying for a message. You should probably apply that to your life, you know. And so I said, all right, let's do that. And so I, I reached out to the people in my community and staff and just said, could you give me things that I need to be grateful for? And I got a whole list of them. It's just some, like our director of Route 54 talked about our kids every week going in there and learning Bible verses and loading up with the sheer privilege of the knowledge of God in their life and then talking about them, putting on the armor of God and going out and living that out in their life in ways that's amazing for fifth and fourth graders. Um, I had our high school, middle school people say, this is a great problem to have. Here's what it said. We make our students and they get a chance to go to homes throughout the week and we've got all kinds of, of host people that do this. And the problem that we're running into is those kids are having such a good time, they won't leave. <laughs> and then, as you well know, Brian, because they come to my house, right, sometimes. And I'm like, it's like 9 o'clock, 9.30. I'm like, man, I'm old. I gotta get to bed. And they're fun. They're having a good time. They're connecting as a community. It's a sign that the real things are happening that we wanna have happen. We had someone talk about how, um, you know, we have a blessing, and I loved how they said this, that we have more kids right now back there than we do have people who are willing to serve right now. That doesn't sound like a blessing, but it is, that God, God is helping. I was talking to Pastor Fred about this just recently, and he had someone come in and said, I need a refrigerator. Pastor Fred said, well, you need a refrigerator. That sounds good. Can you help me? He's like, where am I going to get a refrigerator from? Fast forward a couple days, he's sitting here at our rooted experience that many people are going through. We have a couple hundred people going through what it means to live this rhythm. He's sitting at his table and he overhears someone behind him like two days later, right? Something like that, Pastor Fred, if you remember the story. Someone behind him go, I have this refrigerator I can't get rid of. Does anyone know? <laughs> Fred's like, oh yeah, that's me. Went, picked it up and delivered it. Had someone last week come in, hear the story about sharing the story and the power of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working through Pastor Chris who was preaching, came in later and said, this is about me and began to understand this week and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. I read those. I remembered. I celebrated God and it encouraged me. And, and it was fortunate enough that, that I had that because I had this community that would do this for me. See, all of us, whether we're actually persecuted like they were in the early church. We need to be involved in a properly functioning community that we can give praise for. Just last weekend, we had someone in our community have a health scare. Well, they were out camping, and they're involved in a, in a community group. And that community group came around them and helped them and guided them and, and really made a difference. Some of you here who are part of this church know what it's like to be in that community, to be one that's based upon the grace of Jesus Christ, not about your particular support for political regime, your particular DNA, your particular socioeconomic status, your particular race, but rather being based around the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ. Some of us, though, are not experiencing that, that ability to celebrate it because we're misunderstanding what it means to show up at church and to be a part of a church. I don't, I don't say this negatively or guilty, but I can hang out in a garage and it doesn't make me a car. We can hang out in a gathering like this, virtually or in person, but it doesn't guarantee we're in community. Attending church, attending a gathering and being in community, they're not the same. So if you're not plugged into something deeper through a men's group or a women's group or a small group or community group on Sunday or many other things like that, I, I deeply encourage it because you need that as part of the people around you to help you in your life to celebrate what God has done. Listen, in 2013, a man named Mike D got up and he had no idea what was gonna happen at the end of the day. But he 
got up, he went to the game, he came down the stands, he went to the floor, he took his shot, and he made it. And when he made that shot, the rest was history. But for one moment, he was more than a fan. In this series, we've been calling each and every one of us to be more than a fan. And we said, if we're gonna be people who don't just relegate ourselves to sitting on the sidelines, up in the stands, or warming a bench, but are actually gonna be out there living the life that Jesus wants us to live, taking the shots that Jesus wants us to take in our spiritual life, we need to be people who are practicing living out the things that are illustrated through the early church, these rhythms. And many of you already are doing that. I'm so grateful for that. You've changed the way you're looking at scripture and you're, you're doing it in a daily way. You've started praying in expectant ways to God. You're walking in some freedom from strongholds. You, you've changed how you look at sacrificial generosity. You're beginning to share your story. You're, you're serving, you're doing all of that. I think we should celebrate that. Because this idea of celebration of rhythm, it isn't just about an introvert, extrovert thing. It isn't about a party thing. It's about the continual joyous practice of praising God's work in our life. And every single one of us have had God do something amazing in our life. I can prove it to you because you're listening to what I'm saying now. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to celebrate. God, we now come to you in a way that maybe we weren't coming to you when we walked into this room with gratitude and thankful hearts of celebrating the fact that we have life and breath physically and spiritually and that you are here and you're listening and you want to help us and that you've, you've provided a community for us to help us walk in ways that you have designed us to walk. And so now, Father, our prayer right now is that in these next few moments, as we take communion, that we do it in celebration. We do it in gratitude and thankfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name.